All right, let's see here. So what are we going to really be talking about today? The unexpected symptoms of gluten exposure. So um, what does that really mean, the unexpected symptoms? Most people think about gluten sensitivity, and what do they think? They think that gluten sensitivity is the same thing as celiac disease. And the reality is, is they're not the same thing. We can make this statement. Everyone with celiac disease is gluten sensitive. We cannot make this statement. Everyone with gluten sensitivity will develop celiac disease. Not true. So gluten sensitivity and celiac disease are not the same thing. Think of it like this. Gluten sensitivity is not a disease. It is a state of genetics. You either have the gluten genes, the gluten sensitive genes, or you don't. And if you have them, um, and you eat gluten, then your body views gluten as a, an, a, an enemy and it mounts an immune response. And for some people, that immune response leads to intestinal damage. That's celiac disease. For some people, though, that immune response does not lead to intestinal damage. For some people, that immune response leads to uh, and neurological damage, leads to liver damage, leads to skin damage, leads to uh, pancreatic damage. For some people, it leads to thyroid problems and thyroid damage. For some people, the problems lead to joint pain, joint damage, diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and uh, dermatomyositis, et cetera. So keep those things in mind that, again, gluten sensitivity is not a disease, it's a state of genetics. If you have gluten sensitive genes and you, and you expose them to gluten, then the response is going to be an inflammatory immune response that leads to tissue damage. If that tissue damage occurs in your small intestine and causes villus atrophy, that's what doctors call celiac disease. However, if that damage uh, does not cause gastrointestinal uh, problems and it leads to damage in other areas of your body, most people get a misdiagnosis. They just get told you have a thyroid problem or you have a joint problem or you have uh, some other type of disease, but gluten is never really associated with their condition. And that's where the problem is because that's where they keep going on eating gluten unbeknownst to them, it's actually the gluten that's creating the damage. And then over time, what happens is accumulated damage continues to destroy their tissues and they end up sicker and sicker and sicker, but being told that a gluten-free diet might not help them. So that's what why we're having this show tonight. Again, it's to help those of you who uh, have maybe been told that going gluten-free is not the right move, uh, yet maybe you do, you've tried like a 30-day trial gluten-free diet or maybe the diet of no grain, no pain, you went on that, you felt better, but you still told you, you were told that you didn't have a gluten sensitivity even though you felt better. So again, we're going to be talking about those strategies. We've got uh, uh, Dahlia chiming in from Atlanta, Allie Mays from Indiana. Good deal. Thanks for tuning in tonight. So what are some of the unexpected symptoms of gluten sensitivity? So what I'm putting up there is a simple diagram to help you kind of understand whether or not uh, gluten is the right move, going gluten-free is the right move. Um, and so some of the symptoms that you see here, it's this is broken down into different areas of the body and some of the more common symptoms of gluten sensitivity. And, uh, and so some of them are not, uh, are not what we would typically think. And so as you go through this, what you can do with this little diagram, if you go to glutenfreesociety.org and or type in gluten sensitivity quiz, this you can you'll pull this up and you can actually print it out. You can uh, you can take it home, you can you can well actually you can print it out at home, you can fill it out, or you can just take the quiz. This very same quiz is online and you can take it there and it will give you kind of an answer as to whether or not going gluten free is the right move for you. So again, if you go Let's see if I can pull that up for you. Give me just a second here. And I'll put up a URL for you to dive into. Here we go. I'm going to push that up. And um, that way you have it in front of you. So a lot of those symptoms in that quiz is listed right here. And if, you ha and if you're not quite sure whether or not going gluten-free is the right move for you, Make sure you you um, click on that and you can go and you can take this quiz. Uh, you don't have to do that right now. We're talking, but you can take this quiz at a later time. So what are some of those symptoms? So in the gut, we've got a lot of people with celiac disease. These might experience, for example, the gas, the bloating, the intestinal cramping and the pain. Uh, but a lot of people with celiac disease also will experience vomiting or diarrhea, meaning they, they become very, very malnourished due to that those two primary symptoms. And then they start suffering with vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And that can lead to anemias. That can lead to uh, difficulty gaining weight, severe weight loss. That can lead to nutritional deficits. 
So, so that's what we would, you know, consider the classic gut symptoms, you, you know, most of those related to celiac disease, but some people don't experience those classic symptoms to that degree. Some people have more specifically, they don't have weight loss at all. As a matter of fact, a recent study showed that the vast majority of people with gluten sensitivity don't suffer with weight loss. They actually suffer with weight gain. In essence, more people, instead of losing weight, actually gain weight and become overweight or obese. And part of the reason why is the gluten-induced inflammatory cascade causes elevations of cortisol, which leads to muscle loss and weight gain. And, uh, and, so, and so, again, many people have weight gain and not weight loss. And this is why a lot of people get misdiagnosed. They go to their doctors and they're not vomiting. They don't have diarrhea. They're not losing weight. So the doctor never even measures for gluten or never even suspects gluten as part of the issue. Instead, the doctor just says, hey, we're not worried about gluten. This is IBS or this is, you know, some other type of bowel disease. So keep that in mind that, that uh, weight gain is one of the prime predominant symptoms of gluten sensitivity, even overweight loss. Um, another common problem that's linked to gluten sensitivity that, that's, that, that can crop up is something called SIBO. So if you've not heard of SIBO before, S-I-B-O, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so in this type of scenario, um, this is one of the things gluten can do is it can feed the wrong kinds of bacteria. And when those wrong kinds of bacteria are being overfed, um, they grow out of control. These are, these are types of bacteria that would be normally present in a GI tract, but when being overfed, they grow out of control. And, and then they can start to create the symptoms of severe bloating. So even if you drink a cup of water, you might see severe bloating. Any, anything you eat, your, your body or your, your intestines seem to bloat like you get pregnant belly almost instantly. This is a common hallmark symptom of SIBO. Now, some people also have severe brain fog and severe uh, mental fatigue, if you will. A lot of these same people with SIBO will develop acne as a problem, so a lot of facial acne. Now, remember, SIBO and gl gluten can cause a SIBO syndrome. So again, SIBO, if you are having a SIBO problem, you might be gluten sensitive. And so a lot of people don't talk about that. A lot of doctors don't talk about that. As a matter of fact, one of the most common treatments for SIBO is to put a person on an antibiotic and particularly one called rifaximin. So a lot of doctors will just use the antibiotic and they won't mention gluten at all. And so they'll use the antibiotic to suppress bacterial overgrowth in the gut, but they won't take away the cause. And the cause being, again, can be gluten sensitivity. So keeping that in mind, that's a common, common manifestation. So you've got to be aware that that can happen. Now, one of the other, uh, one of the other predominant types of, of sets, or I should say subsets of symptoms associated with gluten sensitivity ha don't have much to do with the gut at all. They're neurological symptoms. Now, uh, one of the original names for gluten sensitivity is so, so if we go back in time, right, and we say, okay, uh, what did many doctors actually call neurologically induced problems that were related to gluten. One of the names for originally gluten sensitivity was bread madness. Bread madness, meaning that people that would eat a lot of bread would actually develop schizophrenic-like disorders, schizophrenic-like behavior. So if we look at schizophrenia, one of its nicknames is bread madness. And this goes back, you know, over several decades. So this has been around for, for, for quite a long time, but a lot of doctors don't make that correlation. As a matter of fact, most patients that get a diagnosis, a mental diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, or multiple personality disorder, or bipolar disorder, um, or depression, what, end, what ends up happening is they get medicated. They get medicated with uh, different types of mood-altering medications like Abilify, uh, or SSRIs, or Mayo inhibitors. You know, these are very, very common types of medications that, that are used uh, in these types of patients. But again, gluten sensitivity, gluten for several reasons. One, one of the families of proteins that's found as a chain in gluten is actually called a gluteomorphin. Now this type of protein can stimulate morphine receptors and create gluten addiction. And it can create uh, gluten happiness, if you will, meaning when you're taking, just like if you were taking morphine, it can reduce pain. Uh, it can make you happier. It can make you care less. So if you're high anxiety, it could actually suppress that. And this is where some people actually gravitate toward eating grain because they're actually self-medicating because of the gluteomorphins. This is also one of the reasons why some people eating a lot of gluten have chronic inflammation, but their inflammation is somewhat suppressed because the morphine effect causes a pain reduction. And so they're not feeling as much of the pain as they're on their gluten diet because it actually, again, one of the proteins in gluten can hit morphine receptors causing a pain reduction-like effect. 
So some people say, oh, I don't have a problem with gluten and they have a huge problem with gluten. It just, it's just that gluten not only causes the inflammation, but also masks the inflammation uh, because it suppresses pain through morphine receptors. So it's one of those one of those kind of tricky ways. And again, if you're not testing for this type of thing and looking to identify it, you could you could miss it altogether. Some of the other neurological symptoms associated with gluten sensitivity, some of the other diseases associated neurologically with gluten sensitivity, one is cerebellar ataxia. So this is like generalized dizziness. It's when somebody gets dizzy and they can't walk, they get up, they have a hard time keeping their balance. Uh, some people will develop vertigo um, and, and vertigo and, and, and that can sometimes be coupled with tinnitus or ringing in the ears. So again, that dizziness when trying to walk and the ringing in the ears, these can be symptoms of gluten sensitivity. Another common, common symptom of gluten sensitivity is depression. Another one is epileptic seizure disorder. And I see this very, very frequently in my office. People come in, they've been pre-diagnosed with an epileptic, epileptic seizure disorder. They've been put on medicines and the problem's not getting better. It's actually getting worse. And one of the reasons why is epileptic medicines cause B12 and B1 deficiencies, which can also lead to neuropathies after six to 12 months. And so their problems just progressively get worse. So um, the key with this is if, if you've been diagnosed with epilepsy, you definitely want to have genetic testing to rule out gluten sensitivity gene patterns uh, because it's very, very common. As a matter of fact, it, here's how common it is. There's a show on, on Discovery uh, Channel called Mystery Diagnosis. You may have seen this show before, but Mystery Diagnosis it was a couple of years ago. They did a special on this very thing, how a young child, his mom had celiac disease, uh, and it was very, very fortunate that the pediatrician was on his game because the, the child was developing uh, an epileptic seizure-like disorder. And because the mother had a history of celiac disease, the pediatrician knew the neurological consequences of gluten and was able to pick up on that and get a proper diagnosis for the child. In essence, the child's epileptic disorder was, was being caused as a result of gluten. There was no GI symptom at all. There was no diarrhea. There was no vomiting. There was no gastric pain. There was no abnormal bowel movements. It was strictly epileptic seizure disorder that was manifesting as a result of gluten exposure. So again, gluten can be a very, very big neurotoxin. Don't underestimate uh, its, uh, its capacity to damage nerves. And so that's, that brings us to the next one, which is neuropathy. Neuropathy can be numbness and tingling of the extremities, the hands, the feet. It can mean uh, neuropathy can manifest as sharp shooting, stabbing pain down the arms or down the legs. Uh, some people have a, a, a kind of a migrating neuropathy where it travels from side to side. Some people have a burning neuropathy in their feet, meaning that when they walk, it burns. Uh, these are common, common manifestations of gluten-induced neurological manifestations. So again, if you're, if you're struggling with chronic neuropathy and the doctors are all at a loss, they don't know why you have it. It's not trauma-induced. You don't have a herniated disc in your neck pinching, pinching a nerve, but you've just developed this chronic neuropathy. Um, it's very potentially possible that it could be gluten induced. Now, there are you know, certainly there are other causes for neuropathy, and gluten is not the only cause. But again, if you've if you've got a neuropathy and, and you don't know why, this this is one of the elements that you want to make sure that you have investigated uh, to rule it out. Another common neurological symptoms is, symptom associated with gluten sensitivity is restless leg syndrome, and that actually has to do with. Uh, gluten inducing or changing the bacteria or the microbiome. Gluten can induce a microbiome change that can lead to restless leg syndrome. There've been a few studies documenting this pretty well. And so um, keep, keep in mind, if you suffer from restless leg, a lot of doctors will prescribe, there's a medication called gabapentin um, and, and that's pretty much the mainstay for treatment in that type of situation. And the problem with that is gabapentin uh, long-term use uh, well, one, it, you, it becomes less and less effective, but two, long-term use can affect you in other ways. And one of the ways it affects you is your gut motility. Gabapentin can cause your guts to slow down, so it can lead to chronic constipation, which again, if you're gluten sensitive and that's the cause, and every time you eat gluten, now you're constipated, so the gluten stays in your gut longer. It's doing even more damage because your body's not expelling it out properly because you're constipated. This, this can become a, a much bigger problem for you. And the same thing happens with pain medications like the opioids. Um, uh, some of the medications uh, that people take that suppress bowel function that cause a sluggish bowel can lead to longer gluten exposure time. So again, if gluten is the cause of the neuropathy, gluten is the cause of the RLS, gluten is the cause of the chronic pain, and the pain medications actually are causing constipation, keeping gluten inside of you longer and not allowing it to escape, 
then you can become more and you basically you allow that toxin to stay in you even longer and it can create even bigger long term problems for you. So, again, keep those things in mind as potential symptoms for gluten exposure. As far as as far as pain, as a general rule of thumb, one of the more common ways we see gluten manifest is chronic migratory arthritis, meaning you can get joint pain in the arms, the elbows, the wrists, the knees, the shoulders, even the neck, the spine. Muscles can get very, very stiff. Some people um, oftentimes refer to a disease called stiff man syndrome. Well, the, these types of symptoms can be caused as a result of chronic gluten exposure, the chronic inflammation that it creates. So very, very important. If you're struggling with chronic pain, you've tried, you know, chiropractic, you've tried acupuncture, you've tried pain medications, you've tried, you know, physical therapy, you've tried yoga, you've tried stretching, you've tried exercise and mobility, and none of that seems to work. And none of that seems to give you any relief for any length of time. It's very possible that it's, that it's, uh, it can be a gluten sensitivity that's creating that chronic inflammation. So in essence, the pain can be coming from your food. That's actually why I wrote no grain, no pain. That, that was the premise of the book was to eliminate or alleviate pain from food uh, as a result of, uh, of eating the wrong things. So other symptoms associated with gluten sensitivity that are commonly uh, not credited, meaning that uh, a lot of, and I see this very, very frequently, people struggling with PMS, women particularly, obviously, uh, premenstrual syndromes where there's hyperhydra uh, hyperhydration, so like the swelling of the legs, the swelling of the extremities, the craving, the anxiety, the depression, the cramps, the severe stabbing pains, the heavy loss of blood. These are actually can be um, hormonal changes that gluten induces. Gluten can cause hormonal disruption of estrogen, progesterone. It can cause inflammation uh, around the receptor sites of these hormones leading to malfunctioning. And that can lead to a lot of your PMS type symptoms. So if you're struggling with heavy, heavy PMS, um, you might give the no grain, no pain 30 day diet challenge a try and see if that doesn't help alleviate your next cycle. Um, other symptoms, one of the predominant symptoms, hormone symptoms of gluten sensitivity, and this has been really well documented in medical literature and in studies, is spontaneous infertility or spontaneous abortion or spontaneous miscarriage or unexplainable infertility. And now we know infertility is on a massive rise right now. In essence, we're seeing more infertility today than we've ever seen in the history of mankind. And part of that has to do with environmental estrogens in plastics and in pesticides. But part of that has to do with gluten sensitivity as well. Uh, more people are eating more gluten in this century, in this decade than we've ever seen uh, before. So gluten, gluten exposure is much, much higher. But gluten sensitivity, again, can cause those hormonal changes that can cause or lead to infertility. Um, another another uh, hormonal symptom that is common with gluten sensitivity is PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and this has to do with the blood sugar variation. A lot of doctors treat PCOS with a diabetic medication called metformin because it's a blood sugar disorder. And gluten is notoriously known for triggering or contributing to blood sugar problems, including diabetes and including PCOS. Another hormonal dysfunction, another hormonal problem associated with gluten sensitivity, probably one of the more common ones as well, is hypothyroidism, particularly autoimmune hypothyroidism, which is also sometimes referred to as Hashimoto's disorder. So if you have been diagnosed with a Hashimoto's as a disease and your antibodies are out of control, remember one of the triggers to elevations in thyroid antibodies is actually gluten exposure. So if you're not already on a gluten-free diet, you might consider it as a part of uh, helping you alle alleviate that problem um, before it becomes much more aggressive. Uh, Lori's asking, what is the name of the book? It is called No Grain, No Pain. And I'm gonna put a link up here for you, Lori. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. If you um, go here, you can find Barnes and Noble links and you can find Amazon links. And, and uh, if you put your receipt number into this website, which I just posted for you, uh, we'll give you a free leaky gut guide back, um, which it's a, it's a, it's a 60 plus page guide on how to recover from uh, longstanding leaky gut damage. So you can, Get that for free if you if you um, if you use your receipt and enter it at that website. There, it's just a gift that we have for you um, if you want to pick up a copy. 
Uh, Lorraine from Canada, have your book, No Grain, No Pain, diagnosed with DH. DH, for those of you who don't know, is dermatitis herpetiformis, which is a blister-like skin disorder that can also be kind of one of those symptoms of the skin associated. Now, that's a great transition. Thanks for chiming in, Lorraine. It's a great transition uh, into skin disorders commonly linked to gluten sensitivity. And again, those of you, if you're as you're tuning in, if you like this information, hit that like button for me. Hit that Actually, hit that love button or that flower button for me. Let me know this information is valuable to you. Um, but let's talk about skin disorders that we know gluten can cause. Number one, DH, dermatitis herpetiformis, probably the most well-researched of all the skin uh, diseases that we know gluten can induce. But let's talk about a couple of others that are quite common. Vitiligo. Vitiligo is that depigmentation disorder of the skin. It's when it's an autoimmune response where your immune system attacks the pigment producing cells within the skin. I've seen cases of vitiligo reverse. I've seen cases of vitiligo where the progression was so bad where we were able to halt the progression. And in some cases where the damage is so extensive, I've seen where a gluten-free diet did, diet did not reverse the damage, but it stopped, again, stopped the progression of the damage. But I've actually had a number of patients with repigmentation of vitiligo going on a gluten-free diet. So again, it's not, again, vitiligo, gluten is not the only cause, just like with a lot of these diseases, gluten is not the only cause. There are other triggers, there are other uh, manifestations uh, or triggers that can lead to manifestation. Um, but gluten is a big one. Gluten is a very, very big one. So vitiligo, another common skin disorder that we see associated is psoriasis. And it's highly, also highly linked to psoriatic arthritis. Those two are kind of like twin diseases. Uh, one affects primarily the joints, the other affects the skin. But psoriatic arthritis will uh, obviously cause arthritic pain, whereas psoriasis will cause lesions rash lesions, like scale-like lesions, uh, lesions on the skin. And it can be debilitating because if it starts, if it gets on the face and the arms, it's extremely embarrassing. People are, become very anxious to go out in public because the disease can affect the skin to such a great degree. Where I see a lot of psoriasis uh, are in beer drinkers. That's, that's probably the crowd I see more psoriasis in than, than some of the other crowds. People who drink a lot of heavy, heavy intake of beer. But again, and that's because a lot of your beers are wheat-derived. Um, but that's not, that's not all, meaning that you don't have to be a beer drinker to develop psoriasis. So uh, psoriasis is just another skin condition that we see gluten creator contribute to. Another one is eczema. Uh, eczema, very, very common manifestation of gluten sensitivity. Obviously, eczema has other causes, um, but, but gluten can cause, the, cause it quite commonly. And then one more I'll list on the skin conditions is, is hives, an actual hive outbreak. Now, um, to, to clarify, some people have hives not because of gluten sensitivity. They have hives because of a wheat allergy. They're not the same thing. I know that can get confusing, but a gluten sensitivity means the immune system is reacting to gluten. And a, a wheat allergy means that a different part of your immune system is reacting to the proteins in wheat in such a way that it causes a hive outbreak. So don't confuse the two. You can be wheat allergic and gluten sensitive. You can be wheat allergic and not gluten sensitive, and you can be gluten sensitive and not wheat allergic. I know it gets confusing. And I have a really great video tutorial on that topic. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'll put a little link up for you. Uh, you can watch this tutorial on the differences between allergy, sensitivity, and tolerance because that's just another topic that a lot of people get confused on, and I want to make sure you're not confused. So let me just put that in uh, real quick for you. Here you go. It's coming your way, so you can take some time a little bit later on and go back and watch that video tutorial, but it's a great tutorial on all those unique scientific differences. So if you if you consider yourself to be kind of that nerd who wants to study this stuff and know and understand a little bit more, make sure you watch that video. And you know, if you're struggling with a chronic health condition, make sure you watch it too, because it could mean the difference between how you were um, potentially misdiagnosed. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Kim, just purchased your book. So informative. Thank you. Diagnosed with celiac disease and your book is a Bible to me. Thank you so much for that, Kim. I'm so glad you're finding it helpful. And keep us updated. I love to hear your success stories. That goes for all of you. Love to hear your success stories as you're making diet changes and you're going grain-free and gluten-free uh, and you're finding 
you know, improvements, you know, share those with us. We try to share those stories with our audience. Uh, and the reason why is because your story may save somebody else's life. Your transformation may impact somebody else's life who's struggling with the same problem and just needs to know that, that there's hope that they can, you know, maybe make that diet change and move in the right direction. So, you know, it's, 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 it's super important that you just share your story with us as well. And we'll, we'll share that with everyone else um, through gluten-free society's outreach. Um, let's see here. Adnan chiming in lack of zinc and B vitamins can cause similar symptoms. If you're referring to skin disorder, yeah, zinc deficiency, uh, especially, and, and, uh, one of the reasons why zinc makes a protein called retinal binding protein or RBP, which carries vitamin A. And that's very, very critical. Remember vitamin A is necessary for skin regeneration. So vitamin A deficiency, uh, can lead to skin inflammation and aggressive acne which is why doctors oftentimes want to prescribe synthetic vitamin A for patients suffering with acne. That, that drug is called Accutane. Don't recommend that drug, but, but certainly vitamin A might be, might be a better answer. Okay, let's see here. Let's talk some more about, so we talked about skin disruption. So maybe let's, let's, move, into, um, let's move into some other problems associated with gluten sensitivity. I want to talk about about the liver for a minute, because a lot of people struggle with, you know, with a liver issue, like a, a, a liver, and they're trying to do detox, and they've been told they need to do detox, and what ends up happening is, um, is basically, they're not able to, so they're on supplements to do detox, because they haven't changed their diet, they're not really detoxing very well, because their diet is, i.e. the gluten in their diet is damaging their liver to such a great degree, that they can't make a recovery. Uh, gluten can cause liver disease. There's actually a name for it. It's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but there's another type of liver de disease that's linked to gluten exposure. Uh, and it's an autoimmune hepatitis, meaning that gluten can cause an autoimmune reaction that causes your own immune system to attack your liver and destroy it. So, so keep in mind, if you've got, if you've got a diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, meaning you don't drink alcohol, but you, um, but you, and you don't take drugs that damage the liver and you just don't have a reason as to why you could have this, think gluten first. Think yeast infection second. Okay, so those two oftentimes go hand in hand. A lot of people with gluten sensitivity have a yeast overgrowth and a lot of people with a yeast overgrowth have gluten sensitivity. Um, they're, they're, they can be mutually exclusive, but they don't have to be. They oftentimes come in that pair, but both can cause uh, damage to your liver. Now, one of the other organs which is attached to your liver is the gallbladder. And a lot of people get their gallbladder surgically removed and it's not necessary. They've just got an overly aggressive surgeon or an overly aggressive doctor. And they go and they do what's called a HIDA scan, measuring their gallbladder ejection fraction. And, and, it's, and it's low. And so the doctor says, oh, your gallbladder is broken. We're going to have to remove it. Uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's like your ankle's broken. We're going to have to chop it off at the foot. It doesn't make sense, but it happens every day. I mean, gallbladder surgery is one of the most common surgeries delivered in U.S. hospitals. Um, doesn't make sense that everybody needs their gallbladder removed just because of a HIDA scan. Um, but again, it's just what happens. A lot of people, that's the advice they get and that's the advice they follow. But gluten can cause gallbladder dysfunction. It can cause cholecystitis. Um, several reasons why the inflammation that can cause basically a clogage of the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is not ejecting bile adequately. And when that happens, remember one of the things bile helps is bile helps detoxify. Aside from helping you to digest and absorb your fats, your vitamin A, your vitamin D, your vitamin E, your vitamin K, your omega-3 fatty acids, bile is necessary to help you prevent retoxification. So it helps you detoxify. It helps bile binds on the toxins and it helps you poop them out. So again, if you remove your gallbladder and reduce your body's ability to secrete bile into your small intestine, and you haven't changed your diet to be gluten-free, if gluten caused your gallbladder dysfunction, and you continue to eat gluten, you've just taken out an organ that actually helps you detoxify from the very gluten that you're eating that caused the organ dysfunction in the first place. I know it's a huge source of frustration for me, and, and because I see so many people who've come to me after they've had their gallbladder removed. And of course, after you've had the surgery, you can't put the organ back in, but you have to you have to deal with the consequences, the long term consequences of not having adequate bile secretion into your small intestine. And those long term consequences are fat malabsorption. And, and when you're not absorbing fat properly and it's coming out in your stool, in essence, you're, you've got fat coming out in your stool. Remember, fats and acids, so it can increase the acidity of your colon 
and that increases the the risk for certain types of diseases one of them being colon cancers so so keep that in mind before you make that decision to go have your gallbladder out you might want to get a second opinion you might want to try the no grain no pain diet and get that grain out of your diet see if your gallbladder starts to recover you might want to you might want to try those things first uh, because uh, ultimately, again, you know, once you have the organ removed, you can't get it back. There's no way to replace it once it's gone, and it may not be um, it may not be a very uh, a, a very successful surgery. A lot of people that have that pain, that shoulder blade, that right shoulder blade pain, or they have that kind of pain underneath their rib cage on the right side, um, they get the gallbladder removed under suspicion that it's a problem, and they get it removed, and the pain doesn't go away. Uh, in essence, the surgery was wrong. Uh, and it was a complete failure. Now they're dealing with with a lack of a gallbladder. So um, again, that that sometimes going grain free, sometimes going gluten free is, is is can be a lifesaver for that particular situation. Now, one of the questions coming in right now is, what do you do? You've already had your gallbladder removed. How do you support your digestion? Um, we actually have a formula designed for people that have had a gallbladder removed. It's called Ultra Digest GB. And uh, I'm going to put that in for you, Annie. That was a, that's a, Annie's asking that question right now. Any advice uh, moving forward without a gallbladder? Yes, uh, no gallbladder. Um, here's that link for you coming up right now. So you can, uh, you can check that out. But that's what I would recommend that you take because the enzymes in it help you to process and break down fat so that it, uh, it kind of helps support your ability to digest and absorb fat uh, even in the absence of a gallbladder. So that's what we have. A lot of those types of people that, that come to see me that have already had that done, that's what we keep them on indefinitely because they just don't have that capacity to do it. Now, one of the other things going forward that you can do, Annie, is is also have a, have a good functional medicine doc or if you're comfortable with the doc you already have, have them run vitamin and mineral testing on you where they're measuring for vitamin and mineral deficiency particularly vitamin A, D, E, and K and omega fats, because if you're deficient in those, again, that's what your gallbladder helps you to process and digest. So, um, you know, vitamin A deficiency can cause a lot of problems, including cancer. Vitamin D deficiency can cause 19 types of terminal cancer. It's a known trigger for autoimmune disease. Vitamin D deficiency can create or contribute to the development of diabetes and high blood sugar dysregulation. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to immune dysregulation. So, you don't want to become deficient in fat soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamin E deficiency, vitamin E is one of the most potent antioxidants that our body needs to help defend us from free radical damage, which basically um, prevents and helps to reduce our risk of developing diseases like cancer. Vitamin K is necessary for normal blood clotting and bone calcification. So vitamin K deficiency can cause osteoporosis. It's now being linked to heart disease. So you know a number of different major, major problems associated with fat soluble vitamin deficiency disease um, and again, without that gallbladder, really, really hard to make a comeback on that unless you're supporting it. So that's that's one of the things I recommend that you look at, at doing. OK, so again, I, I, I mentioned I wanted to talk about the liver a little bit. So if you've got a diagnosis of, you know, of, of gallbladder disease, cholecystitis, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis, go get yourself checked immediately, get your genetics run, do the genetic testing for gluten sensitivity. And that's what I want to talk about next. I want to talk about the lab testing for gluten sensitivity because many of you uh, have either been misled or misdirected on what is an accurate way to assess whether or not you have a gluten issue. There's only one way to assess whether or not you have a true genetic gluten sensitivity issue. Remember, gluten sensitivity is not a disease. It is a state of genetics. If you have gluten sensitive genes and you expose them to gluten, the longer you expose them to gluten, the more inflammation you produce, the more inflammation you produce, the more tissue damage you result that results of that inflammation and the more your body can break down. This is why we don't care about antibody testing as it relates to gluten sensitivity and celiac disease because it can be very misleading. Part of the reason why, so if you've had like, for example, anti-gliadin antibody testing, anti-tissue transglutaminase testing, even if you've had other types of antibody tests that measure some of the other kinds of gluten-based proteins, realize that a lot of those tests come back false negative because you have an immune problem, meaning that your body may not be making enough IgG or IgA. And I see this all the time in patients when we measure their antibody levels, their antibody levels are low. 
So when you then you go back and you try to measure their antibody levels to certain proteins that are found in gluten, like in grain, like glutens, um, you get a false negative test result. It doesn't mean they're not reacting to gluten. It means their immune system has is not working properly. And so the test result itself doesn't show a reaction, not because there's not one, but because they're not capable of producing enough of the antibody to show a reaction on a lab test. Very important that you understand that because those types of tests have a very high high level of false negative. Now, if they're positive, they're positive, but if they're negative, there's a high degree of false negative on those tests. So if you've had them done and you didn't catch them, it doesn't mean you're not gluten sensitive. It just means that the test that you ran came back not gluten sensitive. The other problem is that uh, with gluten sensitivity is a lot of doctors, it's the way they define what gluten is. Uh, a lot of doctors will define gluten as a, you know, as a sequence of protein found only in wheat, barley, and rye. And so they're testing this one sequence called alpha gliadin, which is found in wheat, barley, and rye. And it is, it is a, a gluten protein that is linked to celiac disease. All of those things are true, but it's not the only form of gluten. There are lots of different forms of gluten. As a matter of fact, in 2010, a group of Australian researchers discovered 400 new forms of gluten. Just to give you an idea of the quantity of different kinds of gluten, and 40 of these new forms of discovered gluten were more toxic to celiac patients than alpha gliadin. So if you've had the alpha gliadin test done and it came back negative, doesn't mean you're not reacting to some of these other 400 forms of gluten. And it doesn't mean that you're not having inflammation as a result of those. The problem is today there's not a commercial lab that can measure all of these different forms of gluten. We can measure genetics. And, uh, and there's, a, uh, there's a, a nice video on the genetics of gluten sensitivity on Gluten-Free Society. You, if you want to learn more about the genetics, and I'm actually getting ready to, you know, if you, those of you who know my good friend, Dr. Ben Lynch, he's got a great book coming out called Dirty Genes. He's actually getting ready to interview me on this very topic of gluten sensitivity gene patterns, which we're going to go into detail on. So make sure you go check out Dr. Lynch. Uh, because he's got this this uh, this summit coming up on this very topic as well, and I'm going to be talking about that in in much greater scientific detail than what we have time for tonight. So, if again, if you've had a blood test for gluten, if you've had a blood test for gliadin, if you've had an anti tissue transglutaminase blood test, if they're positive, they're positive. But if they're negative, it doesn't mean that you're negative, and you could still be reacting to gluten. So, if you really truly want to know what your propensity to react to gluten is, you want to get genetic tested. HLA-DQ alpha-1 and HLA-DQ beta-1 testing. Now, uh, many of you might be might have the next question that I sometimes see coming across is, um, does that mean uh, like a 23andMe test, like where I can get some of those markers? No, because a 23andMe will not pick up on all the genetic variances that we see with gluten sensitivity. G uh, a 23andMe will only pick up on the variances for celiac disease. So there are some genes that are gluten sensitive genes, but also celiac genes. And that's all 23andMe picks up. It doesn't pick up on, on what are called the non-celiac gluten sensitive genes. Remember that, that, that celiac disease is just one type of problem associated with gluten sensitivity. And 99% of people with celiac have HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8 patterns. But the vast majority of people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity don't. And so if you're not having the right genetic testing done, those markers won't be detected and you'll, you'll get, again, a false representation of whether or not a gluten-free diet is the right move for you to be healthy. So again, I, I highly recommend if you're going to do any kind of testing at all to get a definitive answer, you want to look at genetic testing because again, the other tests, the blood tests are not super accurate. The other genetic tests are not comprehensive. And then if you look at, at some of the other tests that sometimes are done, which it's the test for celiac disease, which is an intestinal biopsy, where the doctor, the GI doctor is looking for something called villus atrophy. Now, villus atrophy is, is a flattening of the intestinal folds and that it can be present, but re realize this, your small intestine has a surface area the size of a tennis court. When a doctor does a biopsy, they're usually taking three microscopic cross sections of your small intestine. Remember, that's like taking, picking up three tiny pebbles off of a tennis court and saying that these three tiny pebbles represent the entire tennis court. They don't. Um, and so you can get false data from a biopsy as well. You can get a false negative biopsy. As a matter of fact, it's quite common. Most people have three or four false biopsies before they get a positive one because it can take 10 to 20 years of damage before the villi 
start to flatten. So that's one of the problems with the biopsy is that if it's positive, uh, rather if it's negative, it doesn't mean that you're not reacting to gluten. Now, here's the other conundrum. If it's positive, it doesn't mean you're reacting to gluten either because corn can cause villus atrophy, parasites can cause villus atrophy, soy can cause villus atrophy, pesticide can cause villus atrophy. So again, just because you have a positive villus atrophy test doesn't mean that gluten is the thing that's causing it. And so some people even get a false celiac diagnosis. I've had patients that had, they had uh, what's called tropical sprue, meaning they had a parasite infection, not a gluten sensitivity. There, there's actually new research coming out that certain classes of blood pressure medications cause villus atrophy as well. And, uh, and so the long, these people that are taking these blood pressure medications, they actually show up with villus atrophy. They don't have celiac disease. They have a blood pressure medication poisoning. So again, um, there's, there's a lot of problems with that type of testing, which is why I recommend genetic testing over any other form because it's just more accurate. And it's gonna give you an indicator whether or not your body is going to create an inflammatory response if it's exposed to gluten. So that's a breakdown on lab testing. Now, let's take a few minutes and I wanna get some of the, some of the questions answered. We got a lot of them coming in. Uh, let's see here. Diagnosed with hyperthyroid, can it relate to gluten sensitivity? Yes, that's Graves' disease. Um, Graves can also be a manifestation. So the opposite of hypothyroid or Hashimoto's is Graves' disease, and this is a common problem linked, can be linked to gluten sensitivity. There certainly are other triggers for Graves. It, parasite is a common trigger. So I, I would say get with your doc, make sure they're running tests to measure, rule out infection, rule out parasite, but definitely want to rule out gluten sensitivity. Uh, again, genetically, that's the way, the proper way to do that. Good question. Uh, Kayla's chiming in. What if after you work out, your muscles get really sore for three days? It's discouraging. What do you suggest to not get that sore? Um, well, first of all, um, that's that. Let's let's classify that. That's delayed onset muscle soreness. If you're getting sore for that long, the, very common to see somebody that's getting sore that long being malnourished. Protein malnourishment, particularly uh, branch chain amino acids. The branch chain amino acids. Um, are, are basically the amino acids that help rebuild your muscle after a workout. So that's valine, leucine, and isoleucine. Those are the three branch chain amino acids. I, I recommend if you're getting super sore after workouts that you supplement with two to three grams of branch chain amino acids and three to five grams of L-glutamine. Glutamine is the, is the predominant uh, amino acid loss after a workout in the muscle, and it can reduce a lot of muscle soreness. Um, but the other thing is, is to just have your nutritional status checked and make sure you're taking care of things. If you've got a zinc deficiency, that can be a problem. Vitamin A deficiency can be a problem. A copper deficiency, uh, B5 deficiency. So there are a lot of things that can create that like intense muscle soreness for, for three plus days after workout. And a lot of times that's, that's associated with just not having your nutrition dialed in as well. But try the branch chain amino acids first. Try the glutamine as a post-workout. Uh, and that might might be quite helpful for you to reduce your muscle soreness. Uh, Donna's chiming in. My friend was diagnosed with spasmodic dysphonia and neurological disorder after the voice muscles and the larynx. Literature says the muscle spasms are caused by abnormalities in the central nervous system and the cause is unknown and the treatment is Botox injections. Could gluten sensitivity be a cause of this uh, too? And could diet change, reverse it. My friend dismissed the idea since it is a neurological disorder. Look, gluten is a known neurotoxin. So to answer your question, that's very, very plausible. And I've actually seen a couple of cases of dysphonia go away with gluten-free diets. Now, that being said, I haven't read a ton of medical literature on the topic. So I can't, I can't come back and say, hey, um, you know, there's, there's five studies that show that, that, that dysphonia is cleared up as a result of a gluten-free diet. But because gluten is a neurotoxin and that's their diagnosis, a neurological disorder, that very well could be the case. Again, there are a number of, there's reflex sympathetic dystrophy, there's autonomic nervous system disorders that, that can be caused by gluten. So it's not a stretch by any, by any uh, sense of the word to, to, to say, hey, maybe 30 days of this might be helpful. And it certainly won't hurt her. So that's where I would, I would start. I would start with, uh, with that as, hey, look, do a 30 day trial. What do you have to lose? Because the other alternative is Botox injections. Does that make sense? Botox injections for the rest of your life uh, so that you can speak properly. That doesn't make any sense to me. So, okay. Um, how about high IgA? I, well, without, without understanding the preference of that, uh, the, the, the pretense of that question. So, Penny, um, 
High immunoglobulin A oftentimes is associated with infection. So like if you had your IgA levels tested and, and your total IgA and they're coming back really, really high, it's oftentimes sign of an infection. And it depends on where you had it tested. So you can test IgA in the saliva, you can test it in the blood, you can test it in the stool. So if it's high in the stool, you might have like a yeast overgrowth. You might have a bacterial infection. If it's high in the saliva, you might have, uh, especially if you've had like root canals and other dental work done, um, you might have a, a, an infection in the oral cavity. If, if it's high in the mucus in the mouth, you might have uh, an infection in the sinus cavity. So number of different things that that could mean. It could also mean that you're reacting to certain things that you're eating, especially if it's high in the saliva and in the, and in the GI tract, you could be having food reactive uh, reactions. Okay, um, good questions. When testing for fat in the stool, do you eat a certain amount of fat and avoid digestive enzymes in prep for several days? I would avoid digestive enzymes just to get a true measure of, of whether or not you have fat malabsorption, but I wouldn't change your diet. I wouldn't necessarily eat more fat or less fat. Uh, I would eat what you typically eat because what we want to see is whether or not your diet in your situation currently is creating a trigger of, of, of fat loss. In essence, is your gut broken to the level that it's not absorbing fat? Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you there. Uh, let's see, Imelda Hilario, I don't have a gallbladder. Um, go back and re-listen to the replay of this, Imelda, because I talked about what you can do if you don't have a gallbladder. Um, Tracy saying, I've had full exome done. Sometimes I wish I didn't know all that I do know now. Yeah. You know, some people will say that, um, you know, it, um, ignorance is bliss. I disagree. I think, I think knowledge empowers and, and that it's just as long as you know what to do with the knowledge. Uh, because sometimes, sometimes ignorance is bliss if you have TMI, right? Too much information with not enough to do with it. Um, Let's see here. I don't know what that means, Michael Chang. Uh, I have anti-gliadin antibodies on. Um, I'm going to assume you mean on your blood test. Uh, so you're reacting to gliadin, which is specifically alpha-gliadin, which is a subfraction of gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye. So, yes, you've got a problem there, uh, but I would go further genetic testing because, you know, based on that test result, many people will tell you to avoid wheat, barley, and rye, but they'll tell you that it's safe to eat corn, that it's safe to eat rice, that it's safe to eat oats and sorghum and rye and uh, millet, and it may not be safe at all, um, especially, you know, if you've got gluten-sensitive gene pattern, it, it's not going to be safe for you. Um, next question coming up, what type of doctor for genetic testing? A good functional medicine doctor. Uh, particularly, we actually, I have a training program for doctors all over the world, um, and I'm going to put up a couple of links for you. One, if you, if you want to get a genetic, if you want to get genetic testing done, you, you don't even actually need a doctor to do that. Although I do encourage everyone to work with a doctor and have a relationship with a doctor if you're struggling with chronic illness. Um, but uh, uh, my experience is that a lot of times, um, doctors don't want to, don't want to order tests. Um, and so if that's your doctor, um, this is the test. This is the proper test. It's the one that will measure all the different genetic alleles that need to be looked at. I'm going to plug that in right now. You'll be able to see that popping up on your feed in just a minute here. Um, again, that's, that's the one I would recommend uh, if you're looking to actually get an identification. And then if you go to that same website at glutenfreesociety.org, there's a, a tab that says GF Doctors. You know, all the doctors that are trained in our protocol are listed on that website. So if you're looking for somebody local who, who you know has been properly trained in gluten sensitivity, that's where you can look to find that doc. Okay, uh, got time for maybe one or two more questions here. What is my opinion on real sourdough bread? Don't eat it. It doesn't, it's not gluten free. Um, you know, the sour, the sourdough, the bacteria that produce the sourdough effect, yeah, does that eat up some of the gluten? Is it, is it maybe make it gluten light? Yeah, but it's not gluten free. And one breadcrumb of gluten can cause inflammation for two months. You're really playing with fire when you're, when you're going that sourdough bread. I've had so many patients, you know, think that and then they come back in after they've started eating it without letting me know or asking the question and they're highly inflamed and they're starting to go back in the other direction again. I just don't recommend doing uh, sourdough bread. Not if you're truly gluten sensitive. Good question. 
Um, question coming in from Misty. Please address the scleroderma, com scleroderma community. Many are on the fence regarding going grain free in my group. Look, the reality is this, Misty. I've never seen a case, and I've seen a lot of them, of scleroderma that didn't respond to a grain free diet. Not a single case in 16 years. That being said, does that mean that all scleroderma is going to respond only to a grain free diet or that grain free is the solution 100% for scleroderma? No, there's multiple triggers. You know, with autoimmune disease, just like with any disease, there are multiple triggers. But one of the biggest triggers for autoimmune disease, particularly even scleroderma, is grain, is gluten. So um, I don't know how, how else to put it more point blank than that. If you have diagnosis of scleroderma and you're not grain free and you're on the fence, look, at the very least, consider, consider a six month stint because that's and I'm answering a second question by answering this because that's about how long you need to go grain free to really, really get the impact of it. Some people feel better a lot quicker than that, but if you're struggling with a chronic painful disease like scleroderma, you need longer than a, a week or a month. Uh, you might need longer than that. You've really got to be off of it long enough to shut down the inflammatory cascade and start rebooting some of your hormone systems. So hopefully that's helpful for you, Misty, and I hope your community maybe takes that to heart a little bit better and, and, and many of them may get on that and, and start experiencing that benefit because they will. And when they do start sharing that with more of the members in your community, because that's what it's all about. We want to get these people help. Um, so that, and hopefully Gina, that answered your question. Uh, when you remove gluten from your diet, how long does it take to notice changes? Generally for most people, a couple months, um, sometimes faster and sometimes slower. Always you want to give it at least six months, never sooner than that, simply because one, it takes two months to get gluten out of the system and to reduce the inflammatory cascade. Remember, small amounts of gluten can create inflammation for up to two months. So you don't ever want to go less than that. But many people experience benefit or improvement before that. And that doesn't mean their disease or their problem goes away before that. But they start to experience the real uh, symptomatic benefit changes before that. So, again, it's, it's different for different people. And there are certainly there are variables and other factors. Everybody's different. No two people are alike. No people, two people's conditions are alike. Uh, Melanie's asking, how can this help autistic children? Uh, it can. Uh, Gluten-free, casein-free diets are rampant in the autism community because they work. Um, now, that's not to say that it's a catch-all or a cure-all. There are a lot of factors in autistic disease. I see parasites frequently. I see heavy metal poisoning, especially mercury, cadmium, copper, excessive copper poisoning, and a lot of these kids with autism. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors with that. Again, it's it's getting with somebody who's got experience with autistic disorders and has got experience in functional medicine. That's that's the best thing that you can do. But but autism typically tends to respond extremely well to a gluten free diet. Good questions. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, Kimberly is chiming in and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, she says, thank you for addressing scleroderma. I have been gluten-free since 2010 and it has been a game changer. Thank you for saying that because there's so many people probably listening that have that disease that just like Misty said earlier, are maybe on the fence. So it's very, very good to hear that testimonial from you that it's been a game changer for you because that may help other people make that decision. Um, next and last question, because I got to run, I got another appointment tonight. Will blood tests show celiac disease? Um, yes and no. So again, blood tests, it just depends. The anti-tissue transglutaminase testing and the anti-gluten antibody testing, um, those two are the blood tests typically that are measured. You can also do anti-endomycial antibody testing. They can show suspicion of celiac disease, but according to medical diagnosis, so if you want to know a, the official medical diagnosis, is that you have a positive biopsy for villus atrophy. That's what medical doctors call definitive diagnosis. Now, I don't agree with it, um, but that if you're looking for the actual diagnostic criteria, it's that you have a positive villus atrophy on a biopsy and that the blood test is only the suspicion that leads the GI doctor to do the biopsy. Look, the whole system, the diagnosis of this whole thing is backwards. That's just the medical criteria. That's what I'm telling you. It's the medical criteria. Do I think that that's right or correct? No, because it, it leads a lot of people out in the dark. It leaves a lot of people out in the rain as it relates to gluten sensitivity because glute, so many more people have gluten sensitivity 
issues that are non-GI, that are non-celiac. So many have non-celiac gluten sensitivity than have actual celiac disease. So that's the problem is that if you rely on a medical diagnostic, diagnostic classification of criteria that are antiquated and are not super accurate, then a lot of people fall through the cracks of the diagnosis. So I've got to end it on that. Last thing for those of you, we're going to do this again next Monday, um, but also we're going to do it again this Friday. I've got a special guest, Chris Kresser. It's actually, um, we're going to be talking about his new book coming up. So if you would like to ask Chris Kresser some questions, make sure you tune in. But next week we'll be on again at six, six to seven, and I uh, hope to see you then. Again, share this episode with somebody that you love. Those of you, especially tonight in the scleroderma community, share this with those people. Let them know. Let them know there's help. Let them know there's hope. The more we share this information, the more we get it out there, the more people we can help. If you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, go pick your copy up immediately. It's kind of like what I call like pre-reading for the Dr. Osborne show. It's, it's If you read it, you'll come to the show with more um, with with better questions. You'll come to the show with with a greater understanding of what I'm talking about and the ability to help yourself even more. That's what this show is designed to do is to help those people who have read No Grain, No Pain, really, really implement it so they can get on the road to, and fast track to health. So again, pick your copy up if you haven't already. We'll see you back next Monday. Again, make sure you hit the like uh, the like button and, and, uh, and share this with somebody else. Have a great evening. We'll see you next week.